Thank you. I haven't done anything yet, but I appreciate that warm welcome. Good afternoon. My name is Scott Appleby. I'm the Dean of the Keogh School of Global Affairs, and I'm delighted to welcome those of you here in the audience and the many hundreds of people participating virtually online to the 2022 Keogh School Forum on Dignity and Development. Established in 2014 by the Notre Dame Board of Trustees, the Donald R. Keogh School of Global Affairs seeks to advance integral human development, a holistic vision of human flourishing grounded in the irreducible dignity of each person. We realize this mission through policy-relevant research and collaboration across disciplines and sectors, and through teaching, practice, and policy analysis. Offering graduate and undergraduate degrees in global affairs, the school is comprised of nine multidisciplinary institutes and a global policy initiative with offices here on campus and in Washington, D.C. The opening of the Keogh School coincided roughly with the publication in 2015 of Pope Francis's encyclical Laudato Si on care for our common home. The themes of that landmark document continue to animate our efforts to advance integral ecology and integral human development. The school's inaugural conference in 2016 for the planet and the poor took the measure of the Pope's call for radical transformation of our ways of conceptualizing our responsibilities to one another and informed our subsequent deliberations and decisions as we set research and teaching priorities. The forum we are hosting today and tomorrow focuses on the transformative process required in order to address what Laudato Si described as one complex crisis manifesting variously manifested variously by the impact of climate change, the persistence of war, the deepening, the deepening immiseration of millions, the flow of migrants and refugees, the violation of human rights norms, and the dismantling or weakening of democratic institutions and practices around the world. Con confronting the world community, Pope Francis writes, is not merely a series of separate social, ecological, economic, political, or technological crises, but rather an encompassing ethical challenge linking all of these domains. Let's assume for the moment that we do face one complex crisis. How would we best conceptualize it? What are the fundamental and most pressing dimensions of that crisis? What are the wisest ways of thinking about it and the most effective approaches to resolving the challenges posed by the crisis? Indeed, how far have we come thus far in realizing the goals of Agenda 2030, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which are compatible in many, if not all, aspects with Francis's articulation of the markers of integral human development? And what are the prospects for the future? If we envision the year 2050, for example, when the students in our midst will be leading and their children will be filling the lecture halls, laboratories, and classrooms of the world, we ask, what will a just and sustainable world three decades hence look like? How do we get there from here? These are enormous meta questions. Indeed, it's almost fanciful to pose them. Fear not. We have chosen our keynote speakers well, for they have all the answers ready at hand for us. <laughs> In all seriousness, who better to get this rigorous conversation started than an economic policy expert, former government minister, and World Bank vice president, humanitarian, and activist who has grappled at the local, state, national, international, and multilateral levels with the challenge of poverty and violence, not least violence against women and children in her home region and beyond, and doing this while leading efforts to reinforce the rule of law 
and shore up democratic institutions and good governance while addressing the economic crisis affecting less secure and developed countries while founding a leading global coalition against corruption. I speak of Obiagela Ezek Wasili, Senior Economic Advisor of the African Economic Development Policy Initiative and one of the co-founders and pioneer directors of Transparency International, the Berlin-based global anti-corruption organization now active in over 100 countries via research and advocacy to hold the world's most powerful to account for the common good. Obi is also the founder CEO of Human Capital Africa, working in the education sector across Africa, and of the board of the School of Politics, Policy, and Governance in Abuja, Nigeria. She was a candidate for office of the president of Nigeria in the 2019 election and became the founding chairperson of Fix Politics Initiative, a research-based citizen initiative. She was Vice President of World Bank Africa Region in Washington, D.C. between 2007 and 2012. Prior to that, she served in the government of Nigeria between 2000 and 2007, first as the Minister of Minerals and later as the Minister of Education. She was a presidential aide and head of the Budget Monitoring and Price Intelligence Unit, which later became the Bureau for Public Procurement. And concurrently, she was the pioneer of the, chair, the chairperson of the Nigerian Extractive Industry and Transparency Initiative in which capacity she successfully designed and implemented the global principles for Nigeria. Obi also worked with the director of Harvard Nigeria Economic Strategy Project at the Center for International Development at the Kennedy School. A charter accountant and consultant, she holds a master's degree in international law and diplomacy and an MA in public policy and administration from the Kennedy School. She was recognized as one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People and by the New York Times as one of 25 Women of Impact in the year 2015. The Prio Priest Research Institute in Oslo named her as a candidate for the 2018 Nobel Peace Prize. To that list of honors, we are proud to add the Ford Family Notre Dame Award for International Development and Solidarity, which will be presented by Ford Family Program Director, Professor Patrizio Perano, after Obi's address and after a brief discussion session moderated by my colleague and the chief architect of this week's forum, Professor Thomas Mastillo. We are just delighted that Obi accepted our, our invitation to come from my Nigeria to, ag to address this group and to interact with all of us over the next couple of days. Please join me in welcoming her. Madam, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you. How, how wonderful to be here with you, this famous institution. When I told uh, one of my friends that I was going to speak at the Notre Dame, she says to me, the Catholic best. <laughs> and, and, I, and, I, and I just smiled uh, because I know how proud of their tradition Catholics are. I, <laughs> I, I really want to thank uh, the authorities of this school for the opportunity of, of joining this year's uh, important conference on dignity and development and essentially looking at issues and concepts that sometimes get lost in the noisy world that sometimes assumes that it has figured out solutions, but instead is creating really dumb problems. <laughs> I, I am excited because when I look at what you're famous for, 
the pursuit of innovation has long played a central role at the University of Notre Dame. From the development of the formula for synthetic rubber to the first wireless radio transmission to pioneering research into human flight, your university has been home to scholars whose accomplishments reverberate throughout history. That's fantastic. I want to be associated with you. <laughs> I celebrate your outlier performance in research focus because I could see that although there's been a general growth in research programs across universities, yours has been a steep trajectory. What I saw is that since 1990, total research spending by U.S. institutions of higher education has grown by just over 237%. But at the same time, your university has spent and grown by over 400%. That's an outlier for something so important for our world, research and innovation. I picked up a fun fact about your school. It says that <laughs> if two people kiss under the lion's eye, it's supposed to lead to marriage. And the second is a figurate walk around both St. Mary's and St. Joseph's lakes while holding hands could guarantee marriage. <laughs> so guess what? <laughs> I would say that this is relevant to me today because I came with my husband. <laughs> I came with my husband, Pastor Chinedu Ezekwesali, a man that I would gladly say yes again to if he asked me to marry him again. <laughs> and so I hope that there's someone who is ready to take me and my endless love to these two spots because I am quite prepared to say yes again after 34 years of marriage. <laughs> Please help me welcome my husband, Pastor Chile Dweza Kwesele. I want to especially thank my direct host, the Dean faculty and students of the Donald Keel School of Global Affairs, only recently established and yet holding its own among schools of global affairs. I want to thank you for the fact that your mission seeks to advance integral human development, a holistic vision of human flourishing that is grounded in the irreducible dignity of each person through multi and interdisciplinary research, teaching practice and policy analysis. I wanna thank especially Scott Appleby. I am so taken by him because there's just something so interesting about Scott, right? <laughs> he literally opens his mouth and you're laughing. <laughs> In all his seriousness, he just gives you this sense of a regular folk that you've known most of your time. And it was only even by emailing each other that I said, I want to meet this guy. <laughs> Scott, thank you for welcoming me 
to your school. I am indeed very happy to be here. And the associate professor, Tom Mustillo, right? I got that right. For making it impossible for me to say no <laughs> to this invitation that brought us here today. I also want to thank my former colleague and friend, Kyle Peter, who was the one that made the connection between the school and I. I'll give you a bit of some preamble before I get to the heart of this conversation. And I want to say that I was actually born to Catholic parents. I was raised in that sound and solid tradition of lasting values that orientated me to public service, even as a preteen. I was a leader of the Legion of Mary. Anyone who is Catholic would know that the Legion of Mary is important to the Catholic girl. <laughs> my dad would tell my siblings and me that, quote, you are privileged and therefore you have a duty imposed on you to use your privilege for others who do not have what you have, unquote. What was my Catholic dad's definition of privilege to his children who were raised in a barely middle-income family? He, well, he said that because we had three things going for us, we were privileged. One, access to quality education. Two, our family name which he always reminded us, was quite dignified. And three, the lasting values that he and my mom were raising us on. So he would insist that if we would take his admonition seriously, that we would be successful in life. He would say, I have no landed property to give to you, but these three things are my legacy gift to you. With them, you will go far in life. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it looks like I listen to him <laughs> because I don't think that I would consider a different life from what I've had in terms of the opportunity to be a person who thinks of privilege differently from quite a number of others. Another thing that my dad would say to us is how important it is to be purposeful in life. He would say that anything created must have purpose. If something created does not have purpose, it should cease to exist. It was quite deep for a young person to listen to some of these. But he used it as a way of telling us that we had no business wasting our lives. Just hoping to eat the nearest meal and then sleep. Or go to the playground and then sleep. He always just felt that we needed to be useful, if not to ourselves, to those around us. So my dad would always say something like, I serve, therefore I leave. I serve, therefore I lead. So we understood that life is essentially about service. Ladies and gentlemen, another lasting lesson to my impressionable 12 year old self was a day out of curiosity. I just said to my dad, why do I see 
so much poverty around me? Why is my country not looking like the ones I see on television? And my dad said, hmm. He said it's because the countries that I see on television are better governed than our own country. And then I would say to him, so why can't our country be better governed? And he replied and said, it's the choice of the people who govern a country to decide whether they would govern well. At that time, our country was already under military rule. Having had its independence, 1960, ended up with a very precarious political stormy, a pol stormy political history that ended up in a coup, a counter coup, and then a civil war, which ended just about the time I was getting to age of real awareness, even though I had been forced to grow up as a four-year-old at the outbreak of the war. And so in this conversation with my father, I say to him, so what can we do about governance? And he says to me, study your book very well. The more educated people get, the more they can demand to be governed better. And there and then I said to my dad, Daddy, when I grow up, I'm going to fix it. <laughs> and my dad scooped me up in his arms, threw me in the air like he would always do. I still remember those feelings, by the way. And I just did not realize that I spoke into the universe. Because what followed my life was a determination to never swallow my voice wherever and whenever I saw poor governance. Whether it was in secondary school or it was in university or it was after I graduated and ended up being very public about my opposition to militarization and to the corruption that underpinned the repression, I just was never going to allow my voice to not speak about the ills of poor governance. You know, we just don't realize what difference it makes to engage young people. Until we all take a journey back to our days of growing. And then we realize that some conversations really did make us. Those conversations with my parents made a big difference to my life. Big difference. In the world that we are gathered to discuss on dignity, children are not dignified. They cannot be dignified adults. Children are not dignified. As adults, they would have nothing to give to anyone in the form of perception of each individual as innately worthy of respect. 
People who are not dignified have no dignity to give. Not because they have it to give to you, but because they fail to recognize that you already carry it. We all come with our self worth. We all come with the respect that is wired into us. We choose to ignore or affirm that the other person is worthy of what we believe we also have. Ladies and gentlemen, the topic of today says one complex crisis toward a just and sustainable future. In reflecting on this, it took me clearly to the Laudata Sea, which sets a very strong contest for my speech today. And so thank you to Pope Francis for such a profound piece of work. I quote, we are faced not with two separate crises, one environment and the, one, and the other social, but rather with one complex crisis, which is both social and environmental. Strategies for a solution demand an integrated approach to combating poverty, restoring dignity to the excluded, and at the same time protecting nature. Unquote. The urgent challenge to protect a common home includes a concern to bring the whole human family together to seek a sustainable and integral development, for we know that things can change. The Creator has not abandoned us. He never forsakes his loving plan or repents of having created us. Ladies and gentlemen, Pope Francis emphasized the dimension of the interconnectedness of all things and the conditions required for the life and survival of society and the honesty needed to question certain models of development, production, and consumption. He calls for an integrated approach to a complex crisis. Well, I want to thank Pope Francis for arresting the attention of the world to the simple matter of how we lost our ways as the people created and given a mandate by the creator, our God, to tend to the garden of Eden called the earth in Genesis 2. He charged us, after all, to be fruitful, to multiply, replenish the earth, and to subdue and have dominion. The original intent of God was never to create a human race that would become producers of their own misery, such that we all lament today. No sooner did God create humanity that even God regretted it. Some of you may not know, but as a believer in the Bible, I saw where God regretted creating humanity. It reads, And Jehovah said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for that he also is flesh, yet shall his days be a hundred and twenty years. And Jehovah saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented Jehovah that he had made man on earth. 
and it grieved him at his heart. And Jehovah said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the ground, both man and beast and creeping things and birds of the heavens. For it repented me that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of Jehovah. I've just read from Genesis 6, 3, 5 to 8. Well, those among us here who are students of the Bible would know that Noah, who found favor, again ended up not living to God's expectation. We get to meet Abraham, then we meet Moses, then we meet Joshua. We meet the priests, the judges, the kings, including the two prominent ones of David and his son Solomon. We get to meet powerful prophets like Elijah and Elisha. Uh, yet, humanity did not please the creator because of the fault he already found in us. Finally, the Bible that I believe says that he came in the person of his son, offering the world's salvation through his blood when he laid down his life and died for the sin of the whole world. In dying, he invites each person to make a personal choice of either accepting him and his word or not. He does not force anyone. I repeat, he does not force anyone. Why am I repeating this? The creator gave to the world from the time of the first Adam to that of the second Adam being the Lord Jesus Christ, the free will to determine things here on earth, the power of choice is God's greatest gift to humanity. The power to freely choose what to do with the earth does not lie with God. It lies with humanity because that power of choice was given. There is the volition that is thrust upon us, as people of the world, to determine what we prioritize. So Pope Francis is correct in the fact of the Laudato Si. Ladies and gentlemen, My one complex crisis, thesis, is that humanity perennially makes bad moral choices. It did in the Garden of Eden, and it still does today in failing to understand this simple but profound diagnosis of Pope Francis when he wrote, our one complex crisis is not merely a series of separate social or ecological, economic or political or technological challenges, but rather an encompassing ethical challenge linking all these domains. There is nothing that reveals the foolishness of the choices of our world than how countries recently have been responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. A virus that came against the entire world. It came for all of us that humanity with all the progress we have made in 
the scientific knowledge, economic policies, and every other aspect of human knowledge quickly retreated into individualistic and nationalistic solutions to a virus that is borderless. What else can possibly describe a perfect foolishness? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is a poor case of not understanding interconnectedness and integral development that Pope Francis spoke about for us to be at a place where countries act as though they can erect borders against a virus, even in the year 2022. Unbelievable, unfathomable, totally reckless and irresponsible. Advanced countries like the United Kingdom and Canada, for example, have secured enough doses of vaccines for their population several times over. Meanwhile, low and middle income countries are struggling to secure enough doses to protect their most at risk individuals, such as healthcare and other frontline workers and older people. With the progress that we have made in science and technology, and the nano speed with which the vaccines were developed and approved, we were all cheerful. As soon as it came to the aspect that has to do with our human interconnectedness, it all dropped. The civilization dropped. The most civilized began to act uncivilized because they faced to recognize that we're only as strong as our weakest link. Ladies and gentlemen, the poor moral choices being made at a time of global pandemic is evident. How and who can produce, how and where to distribute, who will be immunized, and when. The moral and equity issue would have been of a world that would ensure that COVID-19 vaccines are distributed fairly to all populations, and that people of all regions, means, and backgrounds are able to access them because we are all in this together. But mm, a world bereft of moral and equity considerations has decided to act differently. Our world has chosen to divide itself as it is wont to do. Today, while some high-income countries proudly publish their coverage of rolling out the third booster and on an average of 78% of population The low-income countries are just at 1.3% of coverage for the first dose of the vaccine. And we call ourselves the people of the world. Something is fundamentally wrong. And the Laudato Si of Pope Francis is meant to enable us 
ponder about ourselves and our choices. Ladies and gentlemen, not many around the world, perhaps not even many in this room today, might see the foolishness of such blatant, inexplic inexplicable vaccine inequity that is precisely as the World Health Organization chief called it out to be, a world that is on the brink of catastrophic moral failure. COVID-19 impacted my continent. It did not impact it to the extent of the number of deaths. However, it impacted it to the extent of the socio economic devastation that came with it. The GDP of the continent contracted significantly in 2020 and it suffered its first recession in 25 years. Significantly, a country like mine went into a tailspin because it is an oil producing and exporting one. The shrink that happened to economies meant that about 12 million jobs were lost in the travel and tourism industry in places like Kenya and Uganda and Botswana and the rest of them. The African continent was substantially affected by COVID-19 to the point where some 30 million, very low estimates so far, of people joined the class of the poor. And this is in a continent which before COVID was estimated to be the continent of 90% of remaining poor people by the year 2030 if current approaches to development don't change materially. So the continent suffers economically while most of the rest of the world has resumed the part of growth. All of these are global problems that are, could have been handled better by the stronger. The stronger, unfortunately, in a world that has not read the Laudato Si, always do things to make the weaker even more excluded. China still fails the test of transparency and disclosure of the events leading up to and following after the discovery of the outbreak of this deadly pandemic in Wuhan. Is China alone in not being accountable for actions that worsen the conditions of the poor in our world? Oh, no, no. Think back to the global financial and economic crisis that was baked in the financial centers of Europe and New York. Think back to the impact and the devastation it brought on the poorest regions of the world. Ladies and gentlemen, it not only ruined the global economy, 
but it actually took many millions of citizens in my continent out of the trajectory of growth into poverty. Has anything happened to those who were at the center of the malfeasance and the repugnant behavior that led to the collapse of the global economy? No. Perhaps being a Catholic church or a Catholic university, some may have come here to give confession to the Father. What I know is that the rest of the world has not seen anyone be held accountable for what happened. The powerful nations can behave recklessly and they can get away with it because there are no consequences. Before vaccine inequity, ladies and gentlemen, we had a long list of these tragic problems, widening the inequality and creating incomprehensible pernicious poverty amongst the weaker regions of the world. I was looking at some indicators on global inequality in living conditions. Mortality rate of children under the age of five in 2017, 12.7% in Somalia. 0.21% in Iceland. Life expectancy at birth, 84.1 years in Japan. Global average, 72.2 years. In Sierra Leone, 52 years. Mean years of schooling, 14.1 years in Germany. Global average, 8.4 years. 1.5 years in Burkina Faso. Expected years of schooling, 22.9 years in Australia. 15 to 20 years in most Western European countries, 16.5 years in the United States of America. Global average, 12.7 years, 4.9 years in South Sudan. Average income, 116,000 936 in Qatar, $57,410 in Switzerland, global average $15,469, $661 in Central African Republic. Inequality, as you know, is not linear. It is the consequence of multiple of other factors that ultimately trace to humanity's ethical and moral choices of how to handle the earth that we have been given. Besides inequality, the problems like climate change, world poverty, global financial crisis, child abuse, terrorism, including of the cyberspace, grant corruption, 
and activities of criminal gangs and global drug cartels, prostitution rings, and human trafficking cartels have stayed with us as though we're not the world of intelligent people. What is it that stops us from solving these problems? Aha. Uh -huh. Must be the reason they are called complex problems. They are beyond the scope of any single organization or individual seeking to understand and to respond to them. There is often disagreement about the cause of these kinds of problems and how to address them. And these problems are often seen as not capable of being completely solved. They can only be addressed. Complex problems are difficult to, de to define because different people have different opinions about their causes, about the nature of these problems. Your school of global policy talks about them in a way that is consistent with how the Laudato Si described them. The impact of climate change, the deepening immiseration of millions, the flow of immigrants and refugees, and the violation of the human rights and the norms of democracy and peace. These are not as my favorite leadership professor at the Kennedy School, Dr. Ron Heifers, calls them mere technical problems. Not one bit. These are not technical problems. These are problems that are known as adaptive challenges. They are harder to solve because they require some set of social and political choices that border on morality. And so here again, we're back to the faulty moral premise of today's engagement with our world. A certain gentleman or gentleman decided to highlight the differences between simple problems, complicated problems, and complex problems by comparing a recipe that is following a recipe. That's a simple problem. Sending a rocket to the moon, a complicated problem, and raising a child, a complex problem. I know that a lot of the mothers in this room are not in a way. And it says that for a simple problem of following a recipe, a recipe is essential. A complicated problem of sending a rocket to the moon, formula are critical and necessary. A complex problem of raising a child, formula have limited application. We all know that. Same parents, siblings, totally looking different and sounding different. Recipes are tested to assure easy replication. Sending one rocket increases assurance that the next will be okay. Yeah. <laughs> Elon Musk, come and be listening. <laughs> Raising one child provides experience, but no assurance of success with the next. So what is all this saying to us? It is saying to us that the solution to the problem depends on how a problem is understood. That a problem is not really understood until after it has been addressed. 
that the problem cannot be completely solved, that people involved can have very different worldviews and have radically different views about the causes of the problem and the best way to respond, and that solutions to complex problems are not true or false, but good or bad, or better or worse. We cannot know beforehand what impact our interventions can have. Every complex problem is essentially unique. Every solution to a complex problem is a one-shot operation, and every attempt has unintended consequences. Every complex problem can be considered to be a symptom of another problem. One of the challenges of complex problems is that in order to understand the problem, we need to attempt to solve it, particularly at a global and national level. Solutions are often expensive and have lasting unintended consequences which are likely to spawn new wicked problems." Unquote. So what do you think our world chooses to do? Ignore them. We take the place of see no evil, know no evil, speak no evil. If we can deny them as long as possible, if we can erect borders, if we can just put some complex guidelines, if we can just shut out certain kinds of people, the problems will disappear and we don't have to worry ourselves. That's what a world lacking in moral choices of interconnectedness has often chosen to do. That's why, ladies and gentlemen, we're in the year 2022. The world met and said, there are 17 important goals that are necessary to give us a sustainable world. And the SDGs were signed to. That's where it ended, in a ceremony in New York. Following that, the SDGs were off track even before COVID-19. It's hardly a chance that the targets will be met. Is it because the world cannot solve some of these basic problems of ensuring that children would go to school anywhere in the world? Because we know that we're all better off when all children go to school and not just go to school, but actually learn something when they go to school. It's not that. When problems of that kind are not solved, it is because the world chooses not to solve them. Latest data shows that nine out of every 10 children in low-income countries, especially in Africa, cannot achieve basic literacy and numeracy skills, foundational literacy and numeracy skills. Nine out of every 10. That is woeful. Can't achieve at the level of a 10-year-old in comparable nations of the world. And yet, we spend so much time at conferences talking about development. What development? You mean development for a few? To continue to accelerate the widening inequality? Or have we not come to the conclusion that it is human productivity that bridges the gap between the upper percentile and the lower percentile? Have we not come to the conclusion yet that it is about access to opportunity 
And that when there is no access to opportunity, you can't even begin to talk about disparity of outcomes. And where do we land all of this? Well, I am here to land all of this. That our quest for a just and sustainable future is not going to happen until we are prepared to own up to our global hypocrisy. We can't probate and reprobate at the same time. What is going on with our world is that we actually don't feel responsible for each other. Let's call a spade a spade and quit this diplomacy. A spade is a spade, not an agricultural implement. Call it what it is. Even in the midst of a war, we saw the most outrageous situation of our world. We actually had Africans pushed out of trains in Europe, told they couldn't cross into safe grounds. I saw Indians crying at borders. I saw Africans crying at borders. And you say we're one world? There's a problem with us. And the problem comes not just because the whole world has a problem. It is because the leadership of the world is absolutely missing in action. I am here to conclude that the greatest tragedy of our world is that the politics of the world is broken. The world suffers from a famine of leadership. Leadership is in recession in our world. Leadership is the basis of the moral crisis that our world faces. How does it not occur to us that the reason that we cannot solve our development problems is because it is politically costly to solve them. And because the politician only knows how to avoid cost that pertains to them, they choose, therefore, not to lead in the way that these problems can be solved. So I have here, as my closing note, How can this poor progress on the SDGs be tackled? What shall we do about the lack of movement on the WTO, the World Trade Organization? What shall we do about the ineffectual state of our multilateral institutions, especially the United Nations, which has become all but a place? where people meet outside of it. What do we do about development institutions like the one I worked for that suffers a serious mission creep? What shall we do about capitalism which has lost everything that really made it? An economic system that could guarantee the reward of effort, but today guarantees an avoidance of the cost of effort. 
because it is rigged against the poor. Suddenly, capitalism, which I totally and absolutely believe in, is no longer capitalism. It is pseudo-capitalism. It is crony capitalism. Cronism. It is an economic system that's been hijacked by the elite of the world in business and in politics in an incestuous relationship excluding the factors that really are important for capitalism to continue to create the larger prosperity for the larger number. By their action, they have given capitalism a bad name. Capitalism has no enemies but the capitalists, so-called, today. Ladies and gentlemen, what do we do so that those who lectured the rest of the world on globalization and told us how important it was for us to be integrated with the rest of the world are now cold-feated about globalization. They are reluctant now about openness, choosing rather to practice acts of protectionism and nationalistic acts that beggar their neighbors? What shall we do about the fact that the efficiencies of competition are being compromised by virtue of rigged national policies that create a problem and a distortion for the poorer economies of the world. What shall we do to the fact that technology in all its beauty deepens the divide? What shall we do, ladies and gentlemen, to this broken multilateral order which reeks with the weight of poor leadership today in our world, while the great powers continue with obnoxious competition over a world that is in crisis. What I say here in my notes that we should do is what Einstein said. Einstein it was that said that imagination is superior to intelligence. I think that the world has become too intelligent for its own good. And it is now time for us to reimagine our world. It is time to design a new multilateral order. What I see in the Laudato Sea is a call for us to get back to the drawing table of what it means to be a people connected by common destiny here on earth. What I see clearly is that this new design cannot be left to those who created the mess that we all are in. It therefore means that for this design to work, we need to think outside of the usual traditional systems of wisdom. We need to bring to the table of this design those who have been particularly shut out of the doors that close behind the global elite when in their wisdom they decide that they know all. It is time for the world to be designed by the young people and the women. 
and I haven't come here to say to the men that they are useless. It might appear to sound like that, but that was not the intention. There are still some of you that are very sensible and responsible. <laughs> But if this world that we see has been created on a paradigm of inequality because it has been a world mostly designed by one group either in terms of gender or one group in terms of race or one group in terms of political power then it is time to ask that group to rest for a while. So I end on the note that at a time like this, when leadership must emerge to lead the kind of design, the kind of reimagining that is better than what I now hear, all around me, people talking about post-COVID recovery. And I say to them, what do you mean by post-COVID recovery? You want us to recover to what we were before COVID? You were comfortable with that? You go ahead and recover to that. Because I'm not interested in recovering to that world. I'm interested in the redesign of the architecture of our global relations and to place at the center of it the citizens once again. The citizens have been too far from the center of development. The citizens robbed themselves by acquiescing to the hijack of the political space by just a few actors. It is time for the citizens to walk back into that space that they own, especially in democracies. There is absolutely no democracy properly so-called without the active role of the citizen. As a matter of fact, I have maintained it that the greatest office in a democracy is not the political office of a president. It is the office of the citizen. The office of the citizen is the most important office in the land. I don't know why citizens of nations are waiting for a messiah amongst their political class. When people show you who they are, you better believe them. The political class can only be fixed by citizens who decide that enough is enough, and it is now time to redesign. I just hope that there will be sufficient number of us that will begin to probe what that redesign process could look like. I would want to come back next year as a participant and sit like you're sitting today as those who can lead us better in that process, begin to tell us how we can build this from the bottom because it is time for us to build from the bottom. The top has created a problem and you cannot use the same level of thinking that created a problem to solve it. Einstein said that to us. We better believe him and find our pathway from the bottom. 
a lot of the innovation, a lot of the ideas of how to tackle a complex problem is actually waiting to be activated at the bottom of the pyramid. Think about it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for those warm and challenging messages that wove together your personal story with our story here at the Keough School and our shared challenges. Thank, Thank you. you. So we have time for um, one or two questions. And so at this time, if you're interested in posing a question for uh, Dr. Obi, please let us know with raising your hand. And, and we'll invite you up to the microphone at the front of the room. Let us know who you are and your role. And, um, and then we invite you to pose your question. Denise, please. Dr. Ezequasili, thank you so much for being here. It's, it's really an honor to have you with us. And I was really struck by your prelude and the influence that your family had on your value systems and your willingness to tackle such complex issues and your willingness to serve and lead. My question is, as we think about strategies, um, related to value systems, is there, is it possible at all to create a systematic approach to looking at value systems that influence good governance, accountability, and, and the ethical culture that, that we so lack, as you described? Hmm. Thank you. So um, we know that there's no channel better than education uh, to gain behavior modification. What have we done with school curriculum? We have sterilized school curriculum so much to the point where it is threadbare of these values that we talk about. We are so considerate of all kinds of perspective that we no longer even have an irreducible minimum that would hold our universal concept of values together. We are a world that has to be true to itself. And the fact that we're so accommodating of everything that takes away from the values <laughs> that should guide us, the permissiveness that we have allowed, we have to pay a price for it. <laughs> it's, there is a trade-off. And if we want to get back to lasting values, we have to go back to the curriculum and look at what we have allowed and what we have disallowed. There are some fundamental things that children should know from the moment that they walk through that classroom. The teachers are held back from teaching them some things because, wow, who knows who's going to take them before the courts for one thing or the other. The curriculum is the heart of the matter for systematizing these values because you cannot just leave society at these individual levels 
and hope that the retail summation of the different things that we believe would pan out, it just ends up not being so. There is a whole social issue. When I look at America and I see a country that's actually now suffering from tribalism, I'm shocked. It surprises me. It really does surprise me. This country was, for all its wants, and it does have them, could at least muster a certain degree of clarity as a country. But it's a divided country now. It's so divided. Where are you going to start with the teaching? When parents are already so divided, the children know that there is division. When, when I think of these complex problems, this mess we're in, as you said, you know, I, I tend to um, think about, I move right to designing solutions. I, when you're surrounded by people of goodwill like this, it's, it's easy to do that. But what your remarks reminded me of is that we have to look, step back in a sense and, and remember that there must be a will, as you said. And, you know, at the, as you were getting going up there, I was thinking about a will in the orientation kind of at the top, but you, you rightfully reminded us that it, it's a will that really has to come from, from below, an empowerment from below, and, and then that invokes, of course, um, design culture, right, is an yes. emergent uh, outcome of schools and families yes. and communities and, and their need of restoration. I... Yes, Tom, because, I mean, think of it this way. The citizens abdicated responsibility. We, we have to just accept that this problem happened because of the land helplessness, as psychologists would put it, where citizens are simply saying, I outsource my responsibility yeah. to X, Y, and Z so I can free myself up to do other things. Well, society became what it is. Disempowered. Disempowered. Disengaged. Disengaged. Yeah. Apathetic, lethargic, docile, you know, totally indifferent. You, you, look, at, you look at what goes on today where... I, 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 was, I was quite shocked when there was a conversation, it was going on on Twitter, and some Africans were very upset. Uh, and they were saying that, isn't it amazing how the average um, Westerner would sooner defend the right of an animal than they would defend the right of their fellow human being. And they, they were appalled at that. And, and, and so for, for these kinds of ingrained um, perception, how do you begin to tackle global problems? Yeah. We have too many global public bads that require us to sit around the table and to start from a premise of we have a common goal, but we can't even agree on a common goal because the prejudices stand in the way of all of that. And, you know, they, until we can be candid in these conversations, I think, frankly speaking, we should pay people to be candid in our world. 
Because we now have too many PR people. <laughs> Just keeping everybody happy and back slapping. And yet knowing that we've not told the truth to ourselves. This is a Catholic university. I have the freedom to call out for truth. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Because this world of acting, it's a world of show. You put up an appearance. You put up an image. And we just want to pretend. Let's cut the pretense. A world of inequality that continues to dig deeper into inequality. What does it take to solve some of the problems? And by the way, I am so African and not interested in saying that the problem of the continent belongs to the rest of the world. No, I give hell to the leaders of my continent. <laughs> because if you're a leader, you have a responsibility to your people. You cannot abdicate responsibility and say that the whole world owes you something. Yes, the world does owe Africa something. There has to come a time when Europe and Africa must have a conversation around some important issues. The two topics of colonialism and slave trade are unfinished businesses. They stand in the way of collaboration. There are things that we've decided to sweep under the carpet. No, they must come out. But they must be spoken of with such reasonableness, with evidence of how things went wrong and how to solve things. Mutual accountability is really important in our world. A world that refuses to take responsibility for things gone wrong is a world that does not have a future, not to talk of a just and sustainable one. Yeah. I want to really say to us that sometimes when we're at events like this, it becomes tough because you're thinking, what's the way out then? We've sat here for how many minutes listening to me? Don't, is there a way out of this? And then you sometimes go home kind of thinking, where are the solutions going to come from? Well, days when I lament like that, days when I feel like there's nothing showing a pathway, show me the pathway, show me the pathway, and I feel like I can't see a pathway, then I remember a number of women who in their local communities are actually raising for us without big budgets the leaders of their communities. Yes, yes, yes. And I suddenly say, that's a pathway. Or I see a young African who, not having had sophisticated education at MIT or Caltech or Stanford oh, or no. <laughs> <laughs> this great university, still are able to compete in the world of technology with their peers elsewhere in the world. And I say to myself, wow, there's a pathway. The problem is we haven't fixed our leadership problem. We have a serious leadership problem. Or you don't? You guys are good. <laughs> well, we are not good. And I know that the rest of the world is not good. Take a look at the politics of the world and tell me where the leaders are. Where are they? The world is reeling in pain. And that's because our leaders are escaping from making tough choices. There are tough choices to be made. The hallmark of leadership is that your choices will cost you something. But our leaders don't want to pay the political price because it's going to take them away from their little fiefdoms. 
And we all just wait until an obituary comes out and it's one of us gone. And then the others keep waiting. And then another goes. And then another goes. And then you would watch dreams go to the graveyard without giving the opportunity of the kind that my father said, I owe those that have not had the privilege that I have had. Right. Yeah. That is why, for me, and that's what you take away, every day must count. I must do something that is outside of myself on any day. It may appear like a retail approach at solving it. But why we wait for the systemic change that so far eludes us in the fact that nations of the world came together, agreed, I know what it took to negotiate the SDGs. And yet, nothing to show that people meant what they were signing to. What kind of irresponsibility yeah. is that? Well, we are gathered here to think about these pathways, and our conversation will turn in the coming day and then over the course of the year to thinking uh, about, those, uh, about those pathways. Yes. And, and so we're grateful for you to join us and to, to kick you. this off. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. At this time... At this time, I'd like to welcome uh, Dean Scott Appleby and Professor uh, Patrizio Pirano to the podium. Patrizio is an economist in the Keough School and the director of the Forward Program in Human Development and Solidarity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our concluding part today is going to be a fun part, which is giving an award. <laughs> and um, just briefly, the... the history of the award, and uh, I just want to tell you that you are in very good company. Past uh, recipients include Nobel Prize laureates and very impactful people all around the world. So we're very, very glad to have you in that company. Um, before I read the motivation for why we think you are uh, a great awardee, um, let me thank the people without which we couldn't do any of this. And I'm, I'm going to start with University Trustee Emeritus Doug Ford and his wife, Kathy, who are right here. Thank you. Thank you really so much. I, I'm actually just coming back from Kenya last week for spring break, and I saw the fantastic work we're doing there. And, and none of this would be possible without your general support. So thank you so much. Um, I also want to acknowledge the leadership of Father Bob Dowd, who founded the program and led it successfully for about a decade. And this is, I mean, it's an honor for me to follow in his steps, and I hope I can do half of as good of a job as he, he did. Um, I also want to thank the Kellogg's um, Institute staff for allowing all of this to happen, and our work would, would not be possible without their fantastic work. And thank the Kellogg Institute Director, Paolo Carozza, who sends his regrets. He's now in Italy for an important meeting with the Venice Commission. And our dean, who, who not only allows us to work, but also gives us very sage advice on how to, to do our work. <laughs> Um, so now I'll move to the reason why we are awarding you the Ford uh, Family Award. And, um, you know, we recognize people who not only say good things, but also do good things. And um, your work on transparency, accountability, good governance for us is extremely important. And I'm going to, we found a video of you, and I think it was an interview at CNN. And so I'm going to read your words. You said, uh, bad governance is so endemic when there are no expectation of results from those that govern society. And therefore, there is no demand for accountability. And even when there is demand for accountability, there is no incentive on the part of the people who govern to produce results. Yeah. We couldn't agree more. And I'm going to call this malignant incompetence. Mm -hmm. And it's malignant <laughs> because it's not neutral. It mm -hmm. affects the, the weakest among us. Yes. So incompetence is not something that is just bad. It's... Worse for yes. people who are most in need. Yes. And that's what we at the Ford Program care about. 
The people are mostly in need. So we are totally aligned with you on this, and we really hope that you continue your fantastic work. Um, Scott already mentioned all your fantastic uh, contributions, so I'm not going to repeat them. I just want to add to your work for Transparency International and in the World Bank, uh, your role in the Bring Back Our Girls campaign, which again, speaking of human dignity and uh, you know, high pressure moments, so thanks again for that. So I'm going to say that at the full program, we always look for ways to promote flourishing of every human being, and your work is a model of how to do this. Uh, very often it is assumed that whenever there is public and private interest and there is money, essentially, where there is resources, corruption is inevitable. Mm. What you told us and what you, your work shows is that there is nothing inevitable about this. It's a choice. Yes. So we want you to be a role model for all the people out there of how we choose every day to avoid bad governance. So thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> so it is... It is our honor today to name Dr. Obi Ezequesili the recipient of the Ford Family Notre Dame Award for International Development and Solidarity. Please join me in welcoming her for the award. Congratulations. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Am I supposed to say something? No, you're all for it. I love this moment. I'll give you a chance to say something in a moment. Um, Congratulations on that Distinguished Award. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Uh, I know that you know that today is a particularly special day in the home of the Fighting Irish. Yes. And uh, yes. lady down there, my wife Barbara, went all over town today to find a button for you that says, Kiss Me, I'm Irish. <laughs> but, but sadly, because we know you would wear it, Kiss Me, I'm Irish. <laughs> but sadly... Somehow, there's not in Notre Dame a button that says, Kiss Me, I'm Irish. If any of you have one, please donate it at the reception. <laughs> so instead, what we have are a few things to remind you of this particular day. This is a, a Irish green oh, that's a, a flowers yeah. for you. Yeah. And we have, not that you're required to wear these right now, but it would look good with your beautiful dress. This is a little scarf. There you go. Africa. And then just just so you'll have enough to take home, here's another thing. So there you go. So you're not going away empty-handed. I am not the car. I particularly love the fact that um, he's been absolutely transparent about the gift to this. <laughs> <laughs> no disclosure requirements. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. So, uh, just to, 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 uh, to close these proceedings, two, two quick notes. Tomorrow we reconvene at 9 a.m., in um, the Corbett. We have brunch at 8.30 yes. in Downs Ballroom in, in Downs Corbett Family Ballroom. Hall. And Pendleton Julian will pick up where Obi left off in terms of talking about uh, how do we design structures and processes and redesign them, which is her specialization. How do we think moving ahead concretely to pick up the charge that Obi gave us? And Anne will take us into some of the specifics in her own work about designing solutions for complex situations. That, that is something we're looking forward to tomorrow morning. And then you can, uh, you can consult the rest of tomorrow's very rich agenda um, where there will be a roundtable discussion, a uh, uh, roundtable on integral human development, and a full afternoon of uh, deep dive into global fragility with uh, officials from the Biden administration and other uh, uh, leaders of NGOs and think tanks 
who are all wrapping their minds together in the wake of certainly the terrible tragedy in Ukraine, but other challenges that the world faces and the fragility of so many parts of, of the earth. So please join us tomorrow. Uh, now, we welcome you to join us for a reception right outside this auditorium for those who are there, for those who are still online. Thank you for being with us. We hope you'll be with us again tomorrow. Thanks again to all of you.